Hello, ladies and gentlemen, this is Professor Sides, and this course is Principles of Microeconomics. We are in Chapter 6, Supply, Demand, and Government Policy. This is the third and final installment of this chapter. Uh, if you will recall from the previous two lectures, we talked about one of the tools that the government will use when it wants to intervene in market operations, and that was price control. We said that there are two types of price control, price ceiling, the maximum legal amount that a price can be charged, and price floor, the minimum amount. And we talked through um, why the government would uh, want to impose price controls. There are four reasons why government would intervene in the market, and that is because they believe that market prices are unfair, which is why we would have price control. And as you will recall, you know we saw that when the government comes in, because they think prices are unfair and they create this policy, this price control policy, sometimes there are um, the policies themselves will create their own unfairness in the form of um, rationing. Um, and then we talked about the two types of, uh, we talked about rationing, we talked about uh, opportunity costs in the form of like long lines. And so this policy that is aimed and intended at addressing unfair market prices creates its own unfairness. Then we talk uh, through um, the second reason for government intervention would be that resources need to be protected. And then the third reason to raise revenue for public, uh, public goods, excuse me. Um, and then we talked about pu what public goods are, that's parks, national security, public education, sometimes public transportation. Um, and then the fourth reason is to influence the market with a specific outcome. And we talk through um, public goods being, again, parks, national security, uh, public transportation, public education. And those are goods that, and services that you and I enjoy together. Um, you can enjoy it and I can enjoy it. And it's one, it's not at the expense of, the, of another. And so they're not mutually exclusive. Now, that was the first two lectures. This lecture, we're going to focus in on the second tool that the government uses when they use, excuse me, when they want to um, intervene in the market operations. And we're going to um, talk through taxes. And we're going to talk through the purpose for having taxes. And we're also going to talk about the effects of taxes. We, uh, we will analyze the effects and how taxes are um, used to intervene um, by using um, our market for pizza. And we're gonna talk about um, how taxes are levied, its effects. And, but before we do, we need to again look at the market before the government intervenes. Remember our market diagram, we have our price and we have our quantity. The supply would be the pizza supplier. For example, Papa John's, uh, Pizza Hut, Pizza Inn, um, Pizza Patron, um, whoever would sell the pizza. And then the demand is you would I, the consumer. And before government intervention, equilibrium without the tax, before the government intervention, we would negotiate through the market how much to pay for a pie, a pizza pie. And so when we negotiated, we, we um, agreed that $10 would be an acceptable price to pay for, say, a large pizza. And um, at $10, there are 500 cons consumers who are willing and able to buy that pizza. So the market agreed on the market price or equilibrium price, which is $10, and the market quantity or equilibrium quantity, which is 500. Now, once the taxes are imposed, the government comes in and they decide they want to impose um, a tax, we must look at what happens. If the buyer um, must pay for the taxes, because we have to first decide who's going to pay the taxes. Are we going, is the government going to put the tax burden on the buyer or are they going to put it on the seller? So if the, ta if the government decides to tax the buyer and the seller wants to maintain its um, price, I mean, it maintain its quantity, in order for it to maintain its quantity of 500, 
then the supplier would have to lower their price from ten dollars to eight fifty. This would cover the 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 tax, but it would also um, cause the demand curve to shift. Remember that we didn't change the price. What we did was we had a change in that. Uh, the government says we're going to impose a tax. So that's a non, that would be the tax itself is a non price change. What's changed, but the, even though it's a non price change, it did affect price. It caused the price to lower, to be lower. Since the, um, since the tax, again, since the tax increase is a non price change, this causes the demand curve to shift, causing the price to again drop. And so, um, the supplier, Pizza Hut, P Papa John's, Pizza Patron, they um, they would see a decrease by $1.50 if they wanted to keep the same price, I mean, same quantity. But as you know, in reality, that's not generally what happens. What generally happens is this. We still have, uh, we still have a shift because the tax is a non is, is non-price change. Now, um, let me make this distinction. When we talk about a change in price, the change in price comes not from the seller or um, from the seller, but it comes from the government. And so if the seller had changed the price, if the seller had changed the price from $10 to $11 for whatever reason, then we will see movement on the demand curve. But because the change in price is due to a tax, which is external to the, external to the market, that is what would cause the shift and not the movement. And again, the reality is that the price will rise to cover the tax. So basically what would end up happening is uh, Papa John's would raise their price from $10 to $11. And then what, what would happen is that we would see a decrease in demand from 500 to 450. And then uh, the buyer is taking the brunt of the tax. They're, they're, that extra dollar extra would go towards the tax. But then the seller would receive 50 cents less. So that covers the dollar 50 tax. Where, and so as you can see that uh, both the buyer, even though the tax is levied on the buyer, the reality of it is is that both the buyer and the seller lose out. The buyer, because they have to pay more for the, for the pizza, the seller, because they receive less for the same pizza. Now, let's shift gears. And if we looked at um, placing the tax burden on the seller, again, this is a non-price change. So then that would cause the supply curve to shift and it would cause, um, because the tax burden is now on the seller, the seller would pass that on to the buyer. And so, um, so that they would not lose out. When the tax burden was left on, was placed on the, on the buyer, the buyer saw an increase in price, but the seller also took a hit. If the tax burden is put on the seller, then the, 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 the seller will pass on the entire tax burden on to the buyer. And as you can see, the, the price of the pizza went from $10 to $11.50. That $1.50 difference um, caused the supply curve to shift. And what we will also find is not only does it cause the supply curve to shift, but it will also cause a decrease in demand. Because now that we're paying $11.50 more, you're going to see an, a decrease in demand. So now we have, we call it, we had a supply shift that causes um, a new equilibrium. That new equilibrium would be at the $11. Um, $11 price, because if they put the whole, if they put the whole dollar uh, 50, if the seller passed on the entire dollar 50 to the buyer, they would see a decrease and they would not want to see a decrease in quantity demanded. So they would again raise the price to $11. They, um, you the consumer would take, um, 
would take the dollar extra hit, the seller would take 50 cent hit, and you again would see quantity demanded decrease from 500 to 450. So as you can tell, whether we put the tax burden on the buyer or, or on the seller, in the end, it doesn't matter because the results will still be the same. And a tax, what the tax ends up doing, even though its intent is to fund uh, revenue, provide revenue for the government so that the government can continue to operate for the betterment of its citizens, the tax in reality drives a wedge between the buyer, the price that the buyer pays and the price that the seller receives. Now, when we look at the effects of taxes, there's three steps to determine what, what the outcome is going to be. So, and these are things that policymakers in general think about when they decide that they want to impose a tax on its citizens. First, they have to look at, will it, by imposing this tax, will it, will it affect supply or demand? Then the second thing that they need to consider is which way would that cause the, the curve to shift? Which way would that cause the supply curve to shift? Which way would it cause the demand curve to shift? And then after, at number three, then we determine, examine how the shift affects price and how it affects quantity. And so all of that is considered when government, um, government, government policymakers will have economists that will help them, um, will help them, excuse me, will help them um, determine what the effects are so they can make their decisions. The economists would advise them to help them make better decisions on whether or not to impose taxes. This concludes the lecture for chapter six. I look forward to speaking with you about uh, what's going on in this chapter in class. Remember your assignments and I will see you later with the next chapter. Thank you.